This episode is proudly sponsored by Resilience Through Fitness. RTF's whole body health approach focuses on helping first responders get adequate rest, fuel, and physical preparedness for their challenging shifts serving the communities they love. The RTF coaching staff are all current first responders that have a passion for fitness. With one-on-one online coaching tailored specifically to your gym, home, and traveling needs, the staff strives to ensure that you come home safe at the end of the shift. RTF also donates a portion of select sales back to supporting veteran and first responder charities. Use the discount code GRITTY15 for 15% off your personalized coaching or next order online. That's GRITTY15 at resiliencethroughfitness.com. All one word, resiliencethroughfitness.com. Welcome to Blue Grit Radio, the podcast that explores making better cops for a better community. I'm your host, Eric Tung. I've been an active police officer since 2007. We will dive into the aspects of police culture, health and wellness, leadership, and mindset. You'll hear from experts, not only from policing, but all industries as they relate to being our best with purpose, passion, and positivity. Join me as we share stories, lessons, and advice so we can all be better for ourselves, our teams, our families, and our communities. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Blue Grit Radio. This is your host, Eric. Tom, thanks for coming on the show. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, so Tom is an experienced law enforcement officer from Washington State. He retired as a lieutenant, and he is the owner and head trainer of Police Training Solutions. And so how I even came to find out about Tom was through one of my guys having attended his training and having amazing things to say. And as Tom, you you frequently, you learn, you advise, and you train on topics, including use of force and legality. I felt what better expert to bring on as we are navigating with a very, I suppose, young industry. And oftentimes we do get hesitant and we're talking about use of force and really what are some things that we should keep in mind and ways that we can prepare ourselves and our teams for best case scenario. And so we can go out there with confidence. But uh, before we get into all that, Tom, if you could please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your career and what it is you do now and what got you into the training realm. Thanks, Eric, for having me. Um, First of all, uh, I'm Tom Ovens. Uh, Like Eric said, I uh, retired after 30 years of service between the city of Auburn, uh, Washington, and Seattle, the Seattle Police Department here. I became involved in training very early on in my career. Uh, 1993, I think I went to my first defensive tactics instructor course, and I went to a pistol and shotgun instructor course. And essentially, uh, because I volunteered, I got sent. Um, so I've been uh, training around and been involved in use force training for a long time. Uh, in 2001, I was hired by a law firm uh, that had represented me uh, in a trial for excessive force and false imprisonment uh, to become an expert witness. So I've been doing expert witness work since then uh, for agencies uh all over Washington state from very small, you know, three and four officer agencies to, you know, even the Seattle PD, uh, you know, the bigger cities, Tacoma, Spokane, Spokane County. So uh, on a a broad variety of topics, uh, but mostly around uh, police officers out out doing police work and detectives doing detective work, Those kinds of issues, uh, search and seizure, use of force, uh, false arrest, excessive force, uh, you name it, uh, tactics, decision making, all things I will testify about. Uh, In 2015, I started my company, uh, Police Training Solutions, to formalize kind of what I've been doing since 2001, but more with an emphasis on training and training around these problems uh, that keep popping up, recurring problems. where the officers are out doing what we think is right. And the Ninth Circuit says uh, we're not, uh, according to them. And, uh, mm-hmm. and then with the advent of the police reform laws in Washington State post-George Floyd, where every year for three years or four now, they've changed the law to some degree, there's been a huge interest and demand for uh, vendor training on use of force and use of force reform, quote unquote. So that's what I've been doing. You know, I've probably trained just privately in the last, since 2015, a thousand officers or more from just Washington State and Oregon. Uh, I also started doing casework in Oregon. So 
you know, in all the training, I just try to bring the lessons learned from all that experience of seeing how these things end up on the backside, you know, but recognizing that we still have to do, bit, you know, police work, but how do we protect ourselves on the backside uh, and, you know, protect ourselves on the front side yeah. because we know the law and we don't hesitate and get hurt. So I think you said it right there and we talked a little bit before the recording started, but it's yeah, that hesitation that we're seeing. And I've spoken many times and I'm continuing to speak and write about this. I think that we have this increased challenge in law enforcement, not just because of the increased, I suppose, legislation challenges and the court of public opinion. Maybe we'll go there specifically, but we have more young cops across the nation than ever because we've had the largest attrition in the last few years, you know, because of the you know, the post Floyd era that we're now kind of navigating and starting to come out of, I, I like to think optimistically. So what are some of the things that you see as far as like creating that hesitation and ways to combat it? Well, I think to me, the biggest thing is confusion over what these laws mean. And I'll give you an example. So for my entire career, I worked under, you know, 9816 you know, 010 and 9816020, which are defenses uh, to criminal prosecution. But those governed police use of force with a very minor uh, 10, uh, you know, 31050 law about police use of force in the criminal procedure section. Well, in 2021, they essentially changed the definition of necessary and they changed the uh, when officers can and cannot use force. Uh, and there was some pretty disastrous outcomes uh, of the initial legislation. For example, it essentially outlawed Terry stops for about 10 months, and then the legislature mm -hmm. did an emergency fix. But when you have officers that you're trying to train or are working and trying to keep up and train them, uh, and the laws are changing frequently, that creates a difficult environment for officers to work in. And it's easy for officers to then, well, they're not sure what they can do to, to hesitate. So I would say to officers, figure out what these laws mean at your agency, what your policy means, and how your policy is, is working with these new laws so that on the street, you're not hesitant. But I would also challenge trainers yeah. to do a better job of linking this kind of cognitive information, the law, to the skill training whether it's defensive tactics, firearms, or, you know, patrol tactics. Uh, they all have to be linked to the law and, you know, they cannot be taught in a vacuum because that puts officers in an untenable position on the street. Mm -hmm. They do what they're trained to do and now they're in court facing uh, scrutiny or their criminal case is dropped or now they're being sued or charged with a crime. So, you know, it's, it's a difficult place, but as a working officer, you have to figure out to the best of your ability, what this means for you when you're out there at three in the morning, driving yeah. around, doing what you do. I love how you summarize that. And I think what a lot of listeners would hear is that you got to know, you got to know the law. You got to know, I think in law enforcement, you use the sandbox examples a lot, right? Are we at, what is this call? Like what, what bounds do I have? What rules do I have to play by? Like, am, am I at reasonable suspicion? And you mentioned Terry stops and how we lost that in the state where Sure, I could go out and stop somebody, but if they left, if they didn't want to participate, then I would I had no means to physically grab them, which I think most places in the country would still be like, seriously, you you had that? Yeah, we had that. We were back out of it, fortunately. Uh, however, I think you you hit on a lot of things, which is that essentially competence breeds confidence, right? If we know what we're talking about, we know our bounds, then that will remove that hesitation, right? So. Now, if I know clearly what is illegal and what my powers are, you know, based on the law and my policies and culture, then if someone is doing X, Y, or Z, then I can do X, Y, or Z. And then also my partners know that I'm likely to do those things, and then they're going to react accordingly. But if, we're, if the left hand's not talking to the right, and there's different versions of that, whether it's management, line officers, if it's training department. FTOs, right? If we're not all on the same sheet of music, that's ripe for disaster. Well, absolutely. And, you know, especially if there's a, a cognitive disconnect between, say, line officers out working the street, their skill trainers, 
whether it's uh, you know patrol tactics, defensive tactics, or firearms, uh, and management. You know, management has an exceptionally difficult job in this environment with keeping up with these changes because you know they're doing what they're doing. I mean, they're worried about recruiting, staffing, uh, retention, all those things that management does, budgets. But you also have to keep up on uh, the search and seizure and the use of force, uh, both statutory law and case law, while you're trying to do these other things. And sometimes trainers have not supported management by offering, you know, classes just for management to say, hey, this is a new uh, case law, for example, in search and seizure in Washington state. You guys need to know it. Uh, So when you're reviewing a case, you understand the law, you know, and putting that into play as well in training, both for management and officers. Yeah, that's huge. And uh, even to connect that back to an earlier point, just that that disconnect and the laws were changing so rapidly. Like I was a patrol sergeant. And so I would like to think that I was more attuned to it. And I was talking with other senior officers and trainers and those that were on top of legislative changes. And, And we were discussing amongst ourselves, like, how do we best how do we best navigate this for our crews? How do we lead our people so that we are safe, but we're also on the same page so one person isn't going this way and the rest of us are going that way? And it just took continual conversation. We talked about it almost daily in briefing and not to throw, you know, throw stones or point fingers, but our management, our leadership was understandably waiting for guidance from legal authorities. However, the laws were changed. And we couldn't just wait on the law office to tell us how to do things. I mean, sure, the the uniformity was helpful later, but we had to decide something to do now because we had police work and calls to go to today. Outside of that communication, are, are there thoughts that you have when you were watching from your purview, especially with your expert experience, to situations like that? Because I'll, I'll even insert some of this, where good on our administration when they started to get some guidance and and put some communication out. I was handling admin details as a as a patrol sergeant of chiefs from smaller towns across the state saying, hey, what are you guys doing with this type of scenario? What are you guys talking about regards to, you know, involuntary commitments, something like that, or welfare checks? Are you guys forcing entry? Are you guys grabbing people? And to be able to speak with confidence because we had the conversations, it was really nice to be able to kind of help a smaller agency whose legal advice was weeks or maybe months out. Well, I want to touch on that comment. A very uh, well-respected attorney who actually represented me and hired me to be an expert once told me in this whole debate of uh, force continuum versus teaching case law in the use of force field, hey, Tom, you're out there doing police work. You can't wait around uh, for a lawyer to tell you what these cases mean. Um, You have to go out and do your best and understand this case law is only made after police officers do police work. Other thing he pointed out, and, and it's very true, you know, a lot of these cases, and I write blogs on cases uh, from the perspective of a cop, uh, not a lawyer, um, they often tell us what we can't do. They don't tell us what we can do. You know, it seems to always come down to this balancing test between uh, the person's rights to be uh, free from excessive force and, you know, our governmental interest in. Uh, doing police work. So, you know, I I would, you know, just using your uh, involuntary commitment as an example, uh, the Ninth Circuit has made it very clear that a person who is only a danger to themselves, that there is a very low governmental interest in using force, any force, much less uh, significant or intermediate force, which is what they call all of our uh, tools, like tasers Mm -hmm. and OC and batons. So, you know, officers got to think about this balancing test. I got a job to do, but, you know, what's my governmental interest? Uh, you know, and on ITAs, I remember uh, in, you know, pre-COVID, I was going around the state teaching with Andy Cooley and talking about this ITA concept and, and whether or not, uh, and even whether or not you get an order, say, a King County, you know, a designated mental health professional says, take this person into custody. What does that order mean? And some agencies were treating it, well, that's a warrant. And I'm like, well, I don't think that's a warrant. And Andy's like, that's not a warrant. So, you know, if you're going to go busting into somebody's house, understand that you need true exigent Mm -hmm. circumstances, not just that piece of paper. So, 
you know, it's a very interesting uh, time, but as you know, communication's the key. And I often say in my classes, like you brought up as a squad, you need to figure out your, what your like, say less lethal team tactics are, what your team tactics are, how you do your patrol tactics. You, you got to come to an agreement. Uh, and and because you can't, as an officer, often control mm-hmm. what your agency trains or even their agency policy because you're not a policy writer. But how do you put that policy into play? And, you know, policy is another interesting area. Many agencies have Lexapol policy, which is good stuff, but it's written for a national audience, not necessarily for the Ninth Circuit. And it certainly mm-hmm. isn't written to to uh, comport with the model AG policy that's just come out in the last couple of years as part of the, you know, one of the required tasks of the police reform laws in 2021. So, you know, agencies are going to be struggling to marry their policy, Lexpol, with this, uh, you know, AG policy, which are written from two completely different perspectives. One's Mm -hmm. national, one's very focused on Washington state. So, Again, but as an officer, you got to figure out how does this work for me? And to give you an example, I ask in every class, all your tool law, OC, taser, baton, uh, pepper ball, less lethal launchers of any kind, all require, they're all called intermediate force by the Ninth Circuit, and they all require an immediate uh, threat of harm to the officer or another. And I ask in class, what does that mean to you as the person, the officer there? Uh, at the moment that has to decide, what does that look like? And there's huge debate. Uh, you know, some agencies have said, well, we can never tase someone who's fleeing. Mm -hmm. Others have said, well, in certain circumstances, we can't. And what I try to get people to realize in, in a, uh, you at the person using force, you have to make that, that decision and be able to explain why this person, whatever they were doing, fleeing or whatever, uh, how that person's an immediate threat of harm. Other officers said, well, I got to wait till they attack me or somebody else. Well, that's not what the Ninth Circuit says. That's not the case law, right? So, you know, how do you get past Mm -hmm. that? You know, so, you know, officers, we like clear, crisp rules, but in this area, uh, nothing's clean, nothing's crisp, and nothing's bright line. And in fact, you know, Graham v. Connor is kind of against generic standards. So, you're the one that has to decide, do I have it and yeah. how can I explain it? And there's plenty of environmental factors, officer suspect comparisons that would elevate that. And that's the other thing. We often design training as this one size fits all approach. But, you know, as I say in training all the time, what I could do as a 28 year old officer in the city of Auburn in 1991, I could not do physically right before my retirement. I mean, I'm a different person due to injuries and age and and everything else. But even in the beginning, I mean, uh, you know, a 200 pound, uh, you know, ex collegiate wrestler can do something more physical than, you know, 120 pound officer that played no sports. And we hire all those people as long as they pass the background. So there's no, you know, physical requirement to be a police officer. So, you know, it's, that's the difficult part. And, and it's really getting officers to think beyond just, uh, you know, these kind of generic answers. Like, what does that mean to me? I'm the person out on the street. What does this mean to me? What does this policy mm-hmm. mean? What does this law mean? Yeah, I love that. And if I was going to connect a couple ideas, it's the word context. Like, the context matters. Uh, those that were in Washington State for the last few years know how roller coaster it was right like whether we were uh, street cops or whether we were trainers or or managers supervisors we recognized and we could verbalize how complicated it was because we had experienced cops that were seeing the changes of like you know basically policing was like ask tell make and they were like okay hard turn away from that we're going to de-escalate we're going to try everything reasonable on the street what that looked like was too much and i'll just say that and people can beat me up about it later but an example being five officers in a standoff with somebody uh not an armed standoff but just a surround and you know cordon off this parking lot with less lethal options but trying to talk this guy down for 40 minutes you know he was under arrest uh he was 
exhibiting all these uh, pre-attack indicators. He was not wanting to comply. Today, I have confidence that most of our crews would not require five officers and 40 minutes of negotiation because ultimately we are sucking up a lot of resource, not helping a lot of people in emergent situations. I think that after a number of attempts, uh, you know, uh, I'm not going to put a number to it, but shorten window, we probably would use a 40 launcher, get that guy into custody, make the community safe again. Um, so we went from these hard turns back and forth, but even in that, we had people coming in and out of academy that learned literally different laws, different uh, procedures, how to how to handle different calls, whether you let just let people walk away. And those are all people in our agency today that we're having to kind of circle together and make sure we're all on the same page. So the context in that scenario is very huge. Uh, we have a lot of leaders that come from, uh, not in my house, but I hear about a lot of administrators that come from other other areas in the state, but then other uh, states altogether, right? So they are coming in with a totally different understanding of the law. And this is not to disparage them or say, don't hire chiefs from outside, but it does it, it's a huge learning curve. We've to, you have to learn Washington State and where we've come from very recently. If you're going to be affecting some of these policy changes or interpreting an officer's decisions, you know, after the fact, use of force and such, um, and then you even put the other the other branch of context of the individual, right? Because yeah, your younger self has a lot of different options that your older self doesn't have, and you know, your 150 pound officer has a lot of options that your 250 pound officer doesn't have and vice versa. And if someone's asking, hey, is it reasonable if I do X, Y, or Z based on these circumstances? The answer is generally it depends, right? Absolutely. And there, you know, you hit a couple of things there. Um, and, you know, this is a pitch uh, for training. I know every agency is required by the WAC to do at least 24 hours a year. Um, but many agencies struggle to fund that internally. And so when you're struggling to fund that internally and you can only do the basics, say a firearms qual and a taser research or OC research every other year or something like that, and then you have to send your officers out to uh, all these other places to get training, which, you know, does benefit, you know, vendors like me, but it makes it difficult uh, for the agency to one, establish their own culture and two, get all the officers on the same page who may have come out of the academy with different laws in place over time, like you mentioned. So that consistency of training and also the idea of coming back to the sim same topics or similar topics year after year. You know, for example, the entire time I was in the training unit at Seattle PD for seven years, I worked there as a sergeant in the training unit and ultimately as the acting lieutenant. We covered some form of active shooter training, which we called rapid intervention, because we had an active shooter event of some kind every year in the city of Seattle. Uh, they just weren't at schools. They were at coffee shops, bars, uh, you know, other businesses. Um, we had one at a university, uh, one at the you know, Jewish Federation Center. So. Uh, and, you know, we took the lessons learned from each one and incorporated them into the next year's training, whereas other agencies might have treated active shooter training like uh, an inoculation. They did it one year and then they didn't repeat it for three to four to five years. Well, in a changing environment, uh, you know, when we're talking about these fundamental concepts like use of force and, you know, criminal procedure, when when they're changing every year, you you can't do it one year and come back three years from now because uh, you've missed three years of change. So yeah. that consistency of training, building a culture, that's so vital. And, you know, you mentioned the difference between, uh, you know, Washington and other states. That's huge. Uh, but it's also the Ninth Circuit versus the others. Um, and people say, oh, well, you know, one of my frustrations with national level classes is they always go, well, you know, the Ninth Circuit, they're the most overturned, blah, blah, blah. Well, it doesn't matter. We work there. We have to follow their rules. And in fact, other circuits are moving towards the Ninth Circuit, not away from the Ninth Circuit. So in general, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're moving more to, 
you know, uh, restricting officers force options than, uh, you know, the other way. And so, you know, this idea that we should ignore the Ninth Circuit and you hear that in national level classes is super frustrating and counterproductive for all the officers that work out here in, you know, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Alaska, Hawaii, yeah. you know, Arizona, New Mexico. I mean, it's a, it's a tough thing. Yeah. I think on that, you know, not to, not to sidetrack too much on victim mentality, but it's not constructive to dwell on what, what is so challenging, what is so bad, right? I think the majority of us that are in the job recognize it's a challenge, but we choose to do it. So So, I've said this and I truly believe it, but when you have a, when you have a challenging environment, your practices are going to be sound, right? Your decision-making, your policies around use of force are going to be more fleshed out, articulated. If you have to de-escalate and articulate that, then cool. That is likely to keep us out of trouble and scrutiny more than somewhere that is not. And one thing that I like to remind my people about is that, hey, like we, we could be, we could get down on the fact that we have uh, a more restrictive area, or we can recognize that restriction makes for a better uh, product to stand up to things like pub- public scrutiny. Because if we pay attention across the nation in the last handful of years or decades, or even continuing, you know, every few months something happens, whether or not it's justified or how clearly it's justified, if there's a public uproar, it doesn't discriminate between small towns and big cities. It doesn't discriminate between red and blue states. It doesn't care what circuit you're in. If someone has a use of force or a deadly encounter and it doesn't look great, it doesn't look great. So why not recognize that when we have more restrictions, that can be advantageous to us to try to curb and generally curb a lot of that? Well, you touched on something there that uh, I have you know, I was just talking about this at a recent Sergeant's Academy, um, and we we're specifically talking about recruiting and retention. So as a leader, you know, you're a commander. I was teaching sergeants. We have to get away from this concept of learned helplessness, which learned helplessness to me leads to hopelessness, which is why people quit the profession. This is a great profession. There's always been rules, you know, governing our conduct. And, you know, the fundamental rule about use of force, Graham v. Connor, is still a great case. Uh, You know, it's about the reasonable officer. It's not about being perfect. You can make mistakes. You can be human under Graham v. Connor. Now, you know, by knowing and accepting that, hey, we have stricter rules here on the West Coast and in Washington State specifically, and maybe your department has more strict rules. you know, many agencies uh, pre-George Floyd had, uh, you know, enacted uh, the LVNR as a level two type control technique. Well, I worked at a department that never authorized it. We, we had more strict rules. I mean, it, but it is you have to learn to work with what you have and you can't become paralyzed with fear or hopelessness. And, you know, you just end up driving around an endless circle doing nothing. Uh, that's certainly not a way to spend your career, and it's not productive. I mean, you know, and I will thank one of my academy instructors, uh, you know, a criminal procedure instructor. Uh, he's retired now, uh, Ron Lavelle. He was with Seattle PD, but he was an attorney and a cop, and he taught criminal procedure. And his whole thing was you have to learn these laws and these rules, and they're going to change through your whole career. You know, focus on what you can do. Uh, and understand what you can't do, right? But don't dwell on the negative. I mean, you have to understand mm-hmm. the rules, but you know the rules do allow for police work. It's just different. You have to be better. Um, you know, so I would really encourage officers to get away from this kind of learned hopelessness. Like they don't want us to do police work. That's clearly not true. It's swinging the other way right now um, from where we were post George Floyd. Uh, you know. The crime numbers that just came out show that Washington has more violent crime, more property crimes, uh, you know, more homicides uh, are increasing here versus the rest of the nation, which is, uh, you know, not what we want to see as police officers. So, you know, you got to go out and do the job, but you just have to figure out for you what these rules mean, whether it's a state law, a Ninth Circuit case law or your department policy, Um, because, you know, that's and that hasn't changed. I mean, in 30 years. 
it hasn't changed. You still, when I started, you still had to know that. The other thing you touched on um, was uh, you brought up Ask, Tell, Make. Um, I was around uh, when Gordon Graham first introduced that. That's his concept. Uh, Gordon Graham always assumed that if you were going to ask, tell, make, that you had a legal reason to make the person make. Uh, and I think as a profession, mm -hmm. we took something that was good and it really was meant as a precursor to de-escalation. And it was linked with verbal judo, like, hey, we're going to ask, we're going to ask nicely. We might keep asking. Then we're going to be, give them the warning and tell yeah. them, and then we're going to make them. But, you know, uh, police trainers uh, doing what I hate, which is teaching to the lowest common denominator, uh, dumbed it down to the point where it was this super simple, well, I ask them, I told them I make them. And then you go, well, why could you ask them? Uh, what are you talking about, Sarge? Uh, well, you got to have a legal reason to ask, right? You got to have a legal reason to tell. So Gordon Graham always assumed that. Yeah. Um, you know, so it, it's interesting how something that was meant to, uh, lead to verbal, uh, you know, judo, so to speak, was the old school term for de-escalation, uh, kind of got morphed into this really simplistic model. I, I know Gordon Graham didn't mean that, uh, you know, it's still, uh, somewhat valid, uh, but you might have to keep asking. And if you don't have a legal reason to make, you might walk away or you should walk away. You know, and I think officers forgot that. Yeah, that's a really good uh, explanation because essentially when I when I mentioned that, it's like the cultural of, hey, you already asked him, let's go, like, let's go boot. And if you're a new recruit and you're struggling with finding that confidence, like, well, I already asked him and now it's time. I think, yeah, you've explained it in a very healthy way, which is maybe a, a perfect transition to say, yeah, we may have very sound uh, structures and training to follow and this methodology uh, but then we shortcut or someone does you know pardon my french like a bastardized version of that concept and now we're in this pit of trouble and it it reminds me of what we were saying earlier about case law or what you were explaining which is that you know we operate under case law but at the time it's essentially like what i'm trying to get at is that uh if we mind all of our best practices and we are proactive about this and developing this in a critical way as a team, then that's how we can avoid, quote unquote, creating case law rather than pushing the boundaries. We operate within sound judgment. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, I like that concept. And I think, um, you know, the biggest thing that we, we have to do is. And, and I'm really talking now to management, uh, supervisors and trainers. Uh, you know, when we create something like, for example, uh, and I, I say this in training, prone handcuffing is under attack nationally. Um, there are experts out there that say, will say that the prone position compromises uh, breathing, irregardless of body compression or not. But when you ask them, well, how do millions of people sleep face down every night and not die? Um, they look at you like you're a heretic. Um, and in fact, you know, much of the attack on prone handcuffing is based on science by, uh, from Dr. Ray, who was the King County medical examiner, uh, you know, in the late eighties, early nineties, uh, into the mid to late nineties, I think, um, that, you know, another doctor did, further research, and he had to uh, recant some of his testimony. But it's it's like this idea came into law enforcement of positional asphyxia, and now it's here to stay. And, you know, there hasn't been a, an ongoing thing. So, you know, now you have the recent case, a uh, couple cases out of the Ninth Circuit, really, uh, you know, critical of prone handcuffing with upper body weight compression. So. You know, something that I was trained to do for 30 years is now uh, a no-go. Um, and if, especially if the person's only a danger to themselves. But we have to do a better job of, say, if I'm going to use prone handcuffing, why I use it. There are valid reasons to put someone face down on the ground and arrest them when they resist arrest. Uh, but then I need to be specific in my reporting. Um, and my investigation of that incident, especially if there's injuries, of 
how it was done, exactly how it was done, how much weight, where was the weight? Was it all on their arms? Was any on their back? Was any on their, you know, uh, lower back, upper back, where it was? Um, you know, it, it's because like I said earlier, case law only says what you can't do. It doesn't say what you can do. So as we work through changes in law, whether they be statutory or case law, um, we need to, you know, sometimes advocate for ourselves and say, well, okay, we can't do it this way. How can we do it? Uh, and then come up with ways that to, mm -hmm. to accomplish the law enforcement objective, which most of the time in prone handcuffing is to arrest someone. Um, you know, because it, it that's what, you know, and we don't take them prone unless they resist. Well, there's a, you know, now there's a case critical, uh, again, of high-risk vehicle stops uh, out of the Ninth Circuit, out of uh, L.A. PD. Um, this came out within the last two months. So, again, saying we can't do a one-size-fits-all high-risk vehicle stop. So your trainers and admin people have to get together with the supervisors and redesign training and talk about why do we do this and how do we do it. And officers, frankly, when you do it, you, you got to write more. Like, why did I do this? Not just what I did, because we're usually good at explaining what we did, but we don't explain mm -hmm. why. And why in this particular context, to, to link to your earlier phrase, I use this technique or tactic. Because if we don't put it in, then the other side gets to, you know, in these proceedings, pick whatever they want, uh, and they can create factual disputes, which means we end up with, you know, a denial of summary judgment. So. You know, and I think a lot of officers out there are really uh, trying to do a good job, but they've never had to write to this level um, and, you know, be able to explain mm -hmm. it to this level. And, you know, in today's environment, uh, you know, you go out and you're going to do your police work uh, and you use force. You need to spend a lot of time on, on why it was necessary, why there was no more de-escalation. And, you know, to fit Washington state law, how was that the least amount of physical force? to accomplish the law enforcement objective of getting them into custody or, or whatever you use force for. Those are great points. And uh, I mean, you, you said something that I, you know, I almost wanted to clap when you said it because you're, you're inviting people to focus on what we can do rather than what we can't. It goes back to that learned helplessness, as you called it. And I think that is really a, a huge tenet of what we try to talk about here, which is, okay, cool. We got challenges. Okay. We have obstacles. What do we do about it rather than just stew about it, you know, versus, you know, are you are you constructively talking about this in your roll call so you can put all your great brains and minds together, or are you just using it as an event session that gets you nowhere? And so you gave a lot of really concrete examples. I love how the takeaways is properly articulate why you're doing what you're doing. And if you have if you have trouble with this exercise, if you find yourself as like the guy or gal who gets your report kicked back by your sergeant and like more detail. And you write it again, you reprove it, and they're like, nope, more detail. Like, really paint the picture. Play with this notion of asking yourself why. Okay, why did you, why did you go uh, rush in when the person was down and put a knee you know, on their hip and then start working to cuff them? Why didn't you wait? Well, because I was worried that he'd get back up again. Oh, why were you worried about that? Why were you worried he'd get back up again? Well, he already fled, and he already fought, and he already assaulted two people in the bar. So I didn't want to wait for him to hurt more people or get away. Okay, like now you're starting to paint the picture. Why did you put a knee on his hip? It's like, well, I know that that's going to control his hips. And it's a really low level use of force. I knew that if he was complying, then I wouldn't feel anything. But at the same time, if he tried to get up, then I'd be prepared to put more weight on or do what I had to do, right? Like you can get in the weeds of that, but you can practice doing that as to really paint the picture. And I was notorious. I know this and I will not deny it. I was notorious about kicking back paper when I was a patrol sergeant, especially when I was newer. And a lot of that came from my own experience. You mentioned Andy Cooley. I know Andy Cooley well. He represented me. I worked canine. So I had a lot of use of force and I did have a couple claims. And lo and behold, when I thought I was a very detailed officer that wrote a lot of articulated detail in my use of force, especially this one that I did, which was a pretty significant dog bite. I wish I had paragraphs and paragraphs more. I know exactly why I did it. I can remember a lot of the details, but years down the line, my memory faded. You know, my exact reasoning on the day faded, so I can't exactly testify to it. 
And I worry that, you know, cops lose sight of that because they are so busy because they have so many, you know, cases to write. Uh, they have body cam, which is, uh, which can be a crutch. It can be very helpful. I, I love them for a lot of things, but when people are like, oh, like just look at my body cam. I'm like, your body cam doesn't tell you what you're thinking. Uh, it may inform some of your memory, but it doesn't it, and it's one angle. And so I share all that from my insight. I really appreciate you breaking it down that way. Um, any thoughts on any of those little aspects there? Yeah. So I'd like to jump on, uh, your body camera comment, because um, I've seen this in, uh, several times in large cases uh, where officers will say, see my body camera f- for details. Um, first of all, your body camera might not have any details. Uh, I worked a very large disturbance, uh, civil disturbance riot case where they all said that. And but they're, the way they were standing and where their cameras were worn, they just showed the back of the officer next to. Them. So there were no details at all on the body-worn camera mm-hmm. other than uh, police uh, on some of the back in someone's uniform. So, you know, and I think that was a big lesson learned for them. Uh, number two, body camera only records two senses at best. Uh, one, your vision, and two, your audio. But it's never from your eyeball perspective. It's a different lens. The camera lens is not the same as your eye. The audio recording isn't uh, perfect. Uh, and, you know, there are forensic uh, video people and memory people that are way smarter than Tom Ovens that will say, don't testify to your body camera until it's been proven to be correct. And there are experts out there that say, I would never watch my body worn camera uh, before I gave my first statement because I want to uh, explain what I recall and what I perceive, not what I interpreted. Uh, based on watching a body-worn camera, which officers have testified in other jurisdictions across the country to stuff on the body-worn camera and then been impeached by their body-worn camera because either A, it recorded a false artifact, or B, another camera uh, caught the officer not looking where his camera was pointed during the use of force, so he couldn't have seen it. Now, Hmm. I don't think the officers in those cases might have been lying, but they might have incorporated evidence from the body-worn camera into their statement. And they, you would probably ask them that, oh, yeah, I saw that. Well, what they saw was their body-worn camera. They didn't actually see it at the time of the event. So, But that's a, a rabbit hole you don't want to fall down as a you know, street cop. You want to write the best paper you can, uh, understanding that your body-worn camera is not your perspective. Uh, and we don't record information like a camera. We don't recall it like a camera. Human memory is reconstructive. It's not an exact playback. So, I mean, for example, you could call us each up a week from now and ask us what we talked about. Uh, and it would be different than what you have on audio mm-hmm. recording. I mean, it, it's just a fact of, of human nature. We can't remember everything that yeah. we said in an hour. Uh, well, you know, but some attorney would go, well, didn't you say this, Eric? Didn't you say this, Tom? Well, I I don't remember. Right. And that's true. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I probably not going to remember, especially at my age, but it's one of those things. Uh, the other thing I think, you know, officers really need to do is understand that uh, in the hundreds of use force cases I've worked uh, and those I've testified in, the jury wants to know the why. Your commander or your chief, if they're looking at you for an internal investigation, they want to know why you did it. We can explain what happened. I mean, especially in the higher level uses of force where, you know, an officer involved shooting, there's going to be a ton of evidence that's going to explain what happened. But the most important question is going to be why. And that's what you need to explain, whether it's in writing or in an interview when asked by a detective, um, you know, and then it is why you did what you did. Uh, being able to explain your tactics uh, and why you chose your force options based on the tactical situation. Oh, that's huge. And uh, even with body cams and not to belabor it, because I, I worry some, some officers listening might be like, now I don't know what to do. I, I review it before. And generally I'll just share my insight. Ger- generally in the sake of time and not wanting to review everything, I will write what I recall. And I'll say that. And I even include phrases like, 
the exact order is per my memory, but the camera may show something different, right? Like I'm basically saying these things happened. I don't know the exact order. This is what I'm recalling. Don't hold me to it. Um, however, there have been times where I review certain parts and when feasible, it's great if you can write, I did review part of my body cam to specify this, this engagement or this part. Um, I've seen, I suppose, two sides of the extreme where there are people that don't want to watch their body camera, even though it could help clarify some things. Uh, but then I've also seen an over-reliance on the body camera where officers literally pull that thing up as they're typing and they're kind of going line by line. They're like, well, then I did this and then I grabbed this and then I did, well, you could summarize that and then the details may be further apparent. Do you have thoughts on that uh, as people decide, you know, what what level of engagement they want to do? Because there is a feasibility part too on how how long this will take. And I also don't want to inject, you know, AI as we're talking about that kind of technology coming online for officers and integrating body cam tech. You know, it's, it's very interesting. I, I think, I know officers are going to use AI. Agencies are already moving to it to, uh, you know, to write the report and the AI will stick in a uh, some false statements that you have to take out. Uh, so as a supervisor, if you see that the pink elephant crossed the road, you know, it's not true. Uh, but but I'll say this, um, you know, way back before cameras, uh, we went out there and we wrote a force report based on a use of force or we wrote a crime report based on a crime. And, and we did that. Uh, you know, there are experts out there that say in, in countries like the United Kingdom, where the officer will write their force report and then they will, based on memory, then they will, you know, basically put a line in and say, then I watch my body camera or my video. And then, you know, based on this, these are some changes or additions. But it's clear to the reader what their naked memory was, so to speak, or their raw memory, and what was their memory mm -hmm. afterwards. Uh, you know, before I retired, that was pretty much what I would have done. And uh, well, A, because it was policy, and B, probably a best practice for any kind of high-level OIS type event. Uh, I would have given my first statement or interview uh, without the body cam. And then, uh, you know, Seattle PD would have allowed me to watch it, and we might have done a supplemental interview if they had further questions. But on, say, a regular tasing or something, I would have, you know, written what, you know, what I think happened and then watched the, you know, put the statement in that I watched my body cam and here's the supplemental. Um, you know, so I, I think that that's the thing. Now, there's other experts and a guy that does a lot of civil rights uh, work back on the uh, East Coast, Eric Daigle, who teaches for AELE as well as his own company. Um, you know, he his concern with overly relying on the body worn camera generally in the past has been you're losing your officer perspective because, and I use this example in class. So, you know, you and I get dispatched to a shots fired call on July 3rd. We're thinking that's probably fireworks. Uh, but we got to go because it's a uh, report of the shots fired. Well, we're driving there. We get into the area, uh, we come from different directions. We have our windows down because it's hot out. and We want to, you know, we're good cops. We want to observe the environment. And now we smell that smell from the range, that spent powder smell that, you, you know, you smell every qualification every time you train. Well, now our perceptions just changed, right? Well, that's not going to be recorded on a fleet video or a body-worn camera. That's a, a sense of smell, right? But that changes it. Now we're looking out our window and now we see brass casings in the roadway. Our perception of this event has changed dramatically because now we have this, you know, call of shots fired, the smell of shots fired. We see brass casings. So we park our cars, we get out, we're following the brass trail of, you know, casings and we see blood on the roadway. Well, we're now in a completely different mindset than we were when we got that call. And if we just rely on camera, most of that stuff's not going to be caught, and it certainly isn't going to be translated. I have to put life to that. I have to say, well, I've smelled this smell. I know what it means. I see blood. Now I have a shooting victim somewhere. Does that elevate my responsibility uh, to be, you know, more assertive, do a quicker search, and find that person? Sure, because I don't want them to bleed to death, right? And I have a concern about, well, whoever shot this person, they're on the loose, right? 
you talked about all these things that cops can think about and tangibly bring back, not just to their own work, but to those they work with for best practice. How does one stay informed when we talk about being competent to be confident? Uh, Newsletters, I mean, please talk about your blog, but then other resources that people should look into uh, in Washington, but also regionally to stay atop of all these things. Yeah, I think, um, number one, uh, you know, there's information that gets put out by uh, various, uh, the insurance pools. Um, They will often sponsor training or put stuff out to your, uh, for example, I I believe you guys are in the Washington City's Insurance Authority, WCIA. Uh, Your city contact with them will get newsletters uh, about particular issues like new case law. Um, there's blogs like mine at police training solutions.com. Um, you know, you just send me an email, I'll get, put you on the list and you, and you'll get the mailings. Uh, and then, you know, that you can sign up through, uh, typically fine law or, uh, other places for, you know, your ninth circuit rulings, your Supreme court rulings, uh, those kinds of sources. Uh, and then I, I would encourage in, in, we did this at Seattle as well, uh, and even when I worked in internal investigations, uh, sending your people out to outside training, um, you know, whether it's it's local or it's regional or it's national training, just to make sure that, uh, you know, you're getting an outside view while you're building your own agency culture. Um, I know when I was in the training unit, that was a struggle because, you know, we were, quote, the largest agency in the state. And, We've got everything dialed. Well, you know, A, we got to go outside to prove it. Because even if we think we're the best, let's go prove it, compare ourselves to somebody else. And B, if you don't go to outside training, you become kind of homegrown. So, you know, I encourage, uh, you know, Mm -hmm. people uh, and say you have, you know, listeners from corrections, they should be uh, getting on, uh, you know, Tim Fosnott uh, from arctech.net. His uh, podcasts, he do podcasts about, he does podcasts about corrections, um, you know, and getting out there. Uh, there's, you know, there's more and more ways to get information. Yeah, that's huge. Well, Tom, thank you so much. And you've given us so many resources. Uh, please, if there's anything that you would leave the listeners with, um, and also where people can find you. Uh, I do want to take a moment also to say thank you for your service uh, to the industry, all your years of service, but then as you are fake retired, I like to say, because clearly you're very busy with your business, your blog and training, uh, but continuing to help contribute to law enforcement and truly public safety so we can all be our best and do our jobs the best, safest way. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, You know, I'd say this to people in training. you know, the fastest way to find out about my training is just get on my website, police training solutions.com, uh, hit the current schedule, uh, send me an email and I will get you, uh, the officers hooked up on the, uh, blog, uh, list or the mailing list. Um, and just so they are sure I only send out one email a month, um, cause I am on some lists where I get an email every day, but it's one email a month about classes coming up, the new blog, that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, it's in some months I miss because it, it's just too busy. Uh, you know, the, the other thing I would say, you know, to the officers, when you're out there, you know, you, you gotta just keep, keep on top of this and try to figure out to the best of your ability, what all this change means. And, you know, talk to your squad mates about what this stuff means so that you're all on the same page and, and you're not colluding in a negative way. You're working together. Um, nothing's worse than you know, one officer thinks this case means this and another officer thinks it means that. And they're out there trying to solve a problem together. Uh, you know, and, and that that's the tough part. I mean, things have changed a lot, uh, I think, in many ways for the good in policing. Um, but there are definitely uh, more restrictions on police use of force today than there were, you know, four years ago. But it is just part of it. And, uh, you know, don't be afraid to describe uh, to what you do and why you do it. And a lot of the things that we do, we never called de-escalation, but they are. So, you know, look at it from that perspective. What did I do to avoid having to go hands-on and make this arrest? Uh, And and what did the suspect do 
to force that issue because that sometimes happens, right? Yeah, absolutely. No, that's such a helpful thing, right? Uh, a lot of things are de-escalation. And it's also context. Like how much time did you have? But also, did you try to, did you try to stand over here? Did you try to wait? Um, did you try to get a partner there? All these things all paint into that picture. So uh, yeah, again, Tom, thank you so much for your time. I know that that was a very, it was a very meaningful, informative conversation for me. And I know certainly for the listeners. All right. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for tuning into another episode of Blue Grit Radio. As always, support this community by subscribing, giving us a five-star review, and following, liking, and sharing posts on Blue Grit Wellness on Instagram. You can reach me there or email me at bluegritwellness at gmail.com. Be well and stay gritty.